I'd like to welcome you to the Wednesday weekly webinar series. This is our third series of webinars, and I'm going to show you shortly the upcoming webinars. Uh, my name is Julie Garden Robinson. I'm a professor and food nutrition specialist for the Extension Service here at North Dakota State University. And I'm happy to announce that we have nine more webinars coming up on a weekly basis. So please join us next week at this time to hear Tom Kelb talk about recommended vegetable varieties. Um, we'll hear from Chandra, our agent in, start, or in Burley County, about regulations that apply when preparing food for the public. We'll hear from Dave Sikowski, who is a lawyer and a professor on campus. He will be talking about US food law. If you like wine, you might want to catch Steve Sagasser's talk on home winemaking. And on the 29th, we have a special guest from Dakota College at Botno, Holly Mobby, will be talking about herbs from uh, garden to table. And rounding out our series on April 5th, we'll hear from Kim Koch, who's the Feed Production Center Manager at Northern Crops Institute, who's taken a lot of coursework on FISMA. So he'll be telling you a little bit more, quite a bit more than I'll be sharing today in my talk. And uh, Esther will be joining us on the 12th of April with an update on spotted wing Drosophila, or fruit flies, in North Dakota. Cliff Hall, professor in plant sciences, or food science to be exact, will be talking about how to can low and high acid foods. In, in the case of low acid, that would be for home use. And finally, rounding out the series, is Todd Weinman, and he's a horticulture agent here in Cass County in Fargo. And he'll be talking about introducing youth to gardening. So please join us again. And each of the webinars lasts no more than an hour. Some logistics, I have you all in listening mode. I will try to keep my eye on the chat pod, but I have a lot of things going around. I have three screens on my computer, so I'll try to keep one eye on the chat pod in case you have a question. You can always follow up with me by email or call, whatever. I'm happy to help you. I am basing my talk today on a three-inch binder of information, so you're not getting all of the details, obviously. So if you have some really complex questions, I'm happy to share that information. Um, there is a short survey, and I would greatly appreciate your help in uh, filling out the survey. It will be emailed to you. And because this project was funded by a grant, your responses are really important because I need to share those responses back with the funding agency. We also have a Field to Fork website that grows more and more, and I'm just going to be adding some new handouts. And for those of you who are either educators or those who maybe sell at a farmer's market, we have a whole series of front and back two-page handouts that might be helpful. And we have lots of links to our other resources. And you're totally welcome to use whatever you like. Just go ahead and print it out. There's no special permissions or anything like that. We just want you to use these items and hopefully help people eat safe food and eat healthy food. So again, my topic for today is called Food Safety from Field to Fork. So I'm going to try to um, explain some of the new rulings that have come out and hopefully bring it to life a little bit, whether you are a home gardener, whether you are growing to sell, or you're just interested in the topic. I hope that you glean something from today's discussion and just know that there's a whole lot more that uh, that goes beyond what I'm talking about today. So this is mostly an introduction for you. And I'm happy to see 37 people signed on, so that is wonderful. So today I'll be talking a little bit, as I mentioned, about FISMA, and that's the acronym for the Food Safety Modernization Act. We're going to talk a little bit about microbiology, not too much, but we'll talk about the, the specific microbes that are of most concern in produce. And how do they get there? I'll focus most of my time today on humans and animals. If you decide after hearing today what we're talking about that you want to hear more about soil or water, I can certainly touch bases with our specialists in those areas. Um, they're far more qualified to talk about soil and water than I am. 
And then I'll round it out with some other risks to consider. And the final slide I just popped in about a half hour ago is a page out of a, a publication from a number of years ago, and it's the Consumer Recommendations for Safe Food Handling of Fresh Fruits and Vegetables. That will round off our topic today. So let's get started. Managing the whole idea of food safety on a farm is quite complex. If you think about all the things that are going on in nature, uh, we have birds flying over, you might have cattle, maybe chickens, you might be irrigating, there could be deer, there could be raccoons, there could be squirrels and all other types of animals that we really might have difficulty controlling. And there might also be manure storage if you happen to use manure as a fertilizer. So with all of these different things, it becomes quite a complex issue in terms of management. So along came the Food Safety Modernization Act. It is now completely in effect. And it's the first ever mandatory federal standard for growing, harvesting, packing, and holding of fresh produce. Now there are some people, if you happen to be a grower, you may be eligible for an exemption. And that's an exclusion which might be based on what commodity is grown. And I'll ask a question. In your chat pod, can you think of things, uh, types of fruits and vegetables that would rarely be consumed raw? Just go ahead and type them in if you can think of things that maybe you you need to cook these first. Yep, potatoes, squash. What other ones? Sweet corn. There's a whole long list um, that also includes things like sugar beets, garden beets, sour cherries. I don't think we grow many of those. Uh, other parts of the, the United States that could include cashews. Cocoa beans, coffee beans, collard greens, cranberries, dill, eggplants, figs, peanuts, pecans. So there's a long list of, of things that would be exempted. And then you might also be exempted because you're going to further process these foods. So you will have a kill step. And these exemptions, and I'll show you in the next slide or two, are often based on an average annual produce sales to both qualified end users and also average annual food sales. But it's really important whether we're growing food for ourselves or families or friends or relatives or for the public, I think it's always important for all of us to think a little bit about food safety because nobody wants to get sick. And some of the organisms I will be talking about can go beyond making us sick. They, in fact, can lead to death. So very important to consider all these things. So um, these are the times for compliance with this new produce safety rule. So um, the after the effective date of 126.16, that was when this all came to be. So by 18, businesses with sales, average annual sales over $500,000 had two years. So 2018 would be their compliance date. By 2019, small businesses, and those are defined as uh, selling 250000 to 500000 on an annual basis over the course of three years, so it's a three-year average of 250 to 500,000. They would have till 2019. And if you happen to be a small, very small business with about $25,000 or more, up to $250,000, you would have until 2020. So, you know, you do have a little time if you are a small business and. Uh, Let's go on to a little bit about outbreaks. Now, technically, a foodborne illness outbreak means that two people, at least two people, have gotten sick, and it's been directly connected with that particular food. 
So if we take a look here on this slide, you can certainly see what's been implicated in the most outbreaks associated with produce. So raise your hand if you've ever heard of a foodborne illness outbreak associated with spinach or another leafy green. Yes, <laughs> I figured that would be the case. They made the news in a big way. And in fact, leafy greens amount for 25% of the outbreaks associated with fresh produce. Sprouts, if I've ever been to a conference and anyone talks about what food wouldn't you eat, what, what food do you take out of your diet because it makes you kind of nervous, and the food safety experts I've heard giving talks, nine times out of ten will say sprouts. Just impossible to clean them. And in fact, in a lot of places that serve vulnerable populations, for example, very young children or elderly, uh, they don't even serve sprouts on the menu. For those of us who are reasonably healthy, we can eat sprouts. They won't be a big problem for us, but you can see that they amount for about a quarter of the outbreaks. And then you can look around the edge there to the left of the um, circle. Everything from papayas to grapes, almonds, mangoes, green onions you may have heard of um, oftentimes in things like salsa, uh, cucumbers, even herbs like cilantro, basil, and parsley have been linked to some outbreaks. Berries, and in the case of berries, it's often linked to the water used to clean those berries. Um, even tomatoes and melons. Now, I'm, my main job is actually in nutrition, so I don't want you to be deterred from eating plenty of fruits and vegetables by these. But the thing to remember is that we have to take steps to keep them safe, and certainly growers, food processors are very much concerned that they will always provide you with a safe product. So, you know, these kinds of graphs and images are the reason probably that FISMA was really brought into play because, you know, it can be, it can be a deadly thing if, um, if a foodborne illness occurs. So what microbes are of concern? Now here's a very quick, very, very quick trip through some microbiology. Of course, microorganisms just means they're very, very small organisms. We can't see them with our bare eyes. Um, the main bacteria of concern tend to be um, Salmonella, Toxigenic E. coli, Shigella, and by the way, we're the only carriers of Shigella. Shigella is, has often been associated with outbreaks in daycare centers, child care centers, um, because of the way they've changed diapers and haven't washed their hands. Okay, uh, Listeria, monocytogenes, is a type of bacteria that will actually grow in the refrigerator. And some cases have even been linked to pickles that have not been properly made. They might ferment the pickles, but not heat treat those pickles. So that has been an, an issue with some fermented pickles. Uh, viruses? Let me ask you a question. So uh, norovirus, what do we associate with norovirus? Where have you heard that being a problem? Any idea? Cruises, exactly, cruise ships. Um, it also has been linked to fresh produce. We can certainly transfer in a variety of ways these different organisms. Um, another question for you, hepatitis A. What organ in your body does hepatitis affect? Yep, you all got, got that one here. Your liver is exactly right. And that can have some far-reaching effects. Um, people will have a goldish cast to their skin. The whites of their eyes may appear gold. Um, a third group of microorganisms of concern are the parasites. And these are usually found in water. So it might be Giardia, Cryptosporidium, Cyclospora, and so on. And these, um, this is why when you go to another country, they might tell you don't eat 
produce that hasn't been cooked because it's not that the produce is bad, it's probably very nutritious, but very likely it's been washed with the water that our bodies may not be able to tolerate. So those are three microorganism groups that can be of great concern. So a little bit of uh, background on bacteria. Bacteria are microbes, microorganisms that can multiply both in and outside of a host. And as I mentioned, it might include E. coli 0157H7, which if you think about that one, you probably associate that with ground beef that's been undercooked, and you'd be exactly right. But it can find its way, as we'll see shortly, onto fresh produce. Um, bacteria can multiply very rapidly given the right conditions. Uh, bacteria need food, just like us. They need a certain amount of water, and they need the right temperature. So if you're in a nice room now, right around that 70 degree range, bacteria love that. That's a great temperature for them to grow. So you may have heard of the term good, ag good agricultural practices, or GAPs. These can reduce our risks. They minimize situations that can support bacterial survival and growth. So it might be proper temperature control, for example. Well, I wish you were all in the same room because I have a great demonstration of this. <laughs> it's a little bit harder to show on a screen. But if we started with two bacteria, that would be a very, very small number. It's very unlikely you'd start with that small of a number. So let's say you brought a roast beef sandwich to work with you, and you set it on your desk. Theoretically, every 20 minutes, those bacteria will split in half. So by 40 minutes, we're at four bacteria. Skip down to 100 minutes, we're at 32. Then we really start going. By four hours, you're at 4,096. Keep that on your nice warm desk. You got 262,000, and by eight hours, let's say you didn't have time to eat and you're going to bring that sandwich home, don't do it. Because that has leveled out at over 16 million bacteria. So this is why we in food safety have rules, like no more than two hours at the um, temperature danger zone, which includes room temperature. We want to control temperature. And um, as you see on my screen, some pathogens or disease-causing organisms can make people sick with only 10 cells or less. In the case of E. coli, that's one of the ones. E. coli 0157H7 takes a very, very small infectious dose to make someone sick. And in the case of a vulnerable person, such as a very young child, an older person, someone who's pregnant, someone with a compromised immune system, they are more likely to suffer the worst consequences. So think about the, the conditions that you are uh, storing your food and try to remember these, these little rules of thumb as we go through that I'm sure all of us have learned somewhere along the way, but we have to be careful so we don't get so busy that we um, forget to do some of these things. So again, conditions for bacterial growth, we have to provide them with food. And they like carbohydrates. They really like protein. Uh, they need enough water, or technically it's called water activity. They need enough time to grow. They need the right temperature. And if any of you are food preservers, you know that pH or acidity also affects bacterial growth. This is why we tell people to add uh, lemon juice or vinegar when they're making their salsa or, or even canning their tomatoes. We should always acidify those, or it could be citric acid that we add because some of these bacteria, especially the most dangerous ones in canned goods, um, must have the proper pH. And in the case of oxygen, many will grow with or without oxygen. Some are, you know, you must exclude oxygen in order for them to grow and produce their toxin. And that would be in the case of the botulism toxin. So just, you know, think about 
So there's an acronym we call FAT Tom, food, acidity, temperature, time, oxygen, and moisture as a way to remember what you need to manage or control in order to deter the growth of bacteria. How are we doing out there? Give me a smile if you're still awake. <laughs> I'll give you a smile. All right. So um, the next grouping of microorganisms I just wanted to talk a little bit about are the viruses. And these are very small particles that only will multiply on a host. Um, when I was in microbiology a long time ago, they, they described viruses as a gene with a protein coat. Um, most of the time, contamination is linked to an ill worker who's handling fresh produce. And that person has used the bathroom and has not washed his or her hands. Or the contamination could be contaminated water. And again, like some of our really bad bacteria, it only takes a few virus particles to make someone sick. And these can be very stable in the environment. They can live a long time. So, you know, these, these are the toughies. This is why norovirus continues to be an issue. And there's actually limited options even for effective sanitizers. So what we say, we, you know, you always have to keep your hands very clean, keep your equipment very clean, and sanitize as you can, but really try to avoid um, the contamination in the first place. Uh, parasites. Boy, I'm glad we're not all having lunch because this is kind of an icky topic, isn't it? Intestinal worms, protozoa, and these can only multiply in a host animal or in a human. And they're usually transmitted by water. So again, this is why when you go to a, another country with perhaps not you know, the same sanitation standards that we have, um, you have to be very cautious about whether or not you drink the water. Sometimes these parasites can be very stable. And again, they can survive in the body for a long time before you even become sick. So this slide kind of tells uh, you know, the number of outbreaks, number of illnesses, hospitalizations, and deaths. So let's start at the top there with bacteria. You can see bacteria are linked with almost the most, well, the most deaths by far, the most hospitalizations, the most illnesses, and the most outbreaks. So 85.55% of outbreaks linked to um, you know, foodborne illness produce outbreaks are bacterial. So that's why we spend more time trying to defend our produce against things like E. coli and salmonella. Uh, next in terms of deaths, I guess, would be the viruses. And they also have the most, you know, second to the bacterial, second to on the viral. And 993 illnesses and three outbreaks. So just gives you a, a big view and I was actually pretty surprised when I, I looked at these numbers, and these are from 96 to 2014, so it's not per year, but that's still a lot of people to land in the hospital because they ate their vegetables, 1,844, and 11,377 illnesses. So we want to prevent this, of course. So. Are these microbial risks the only ones? You know, most of these, again, are linked back to the ones I've mentioned, E. coli, salmonella, listeria. But we can also have chemical and physical risks. So chemical risks might be the sanitizer that you use. Um, physical risks are things that we can see and touch. So I'm going to ask you the question I always ask my students when I'm doing a food safety talk. I just gave a talk a few weeks ago, and I said, what do you think is the worst thing that people think of that they could find in their food? What do you think they say? 
Yes, Cliff and Susie and Ellen are all correct. They always say hair is the worst thing you could ever find in your food. It's, yes, I agree. It's pretty disgusting. Fingernail, yeah, that wouldn't be too good either. But, um, you know, it's it would be considered physical risk, but it isn't the biggest hazard. The, the biggest hazards are going to be the biological ones, those bacteria again. Uh, chemical risks, what would be some things that could pose a chemical risk associated with food? Can you think of any, any, anything? Yeah, Janet, correct. Cleaners, bleach, yep, sanitizers, all these things. So we really, if we are using uh, chemicals around food, and it's very widely used, um, pesticides certainly, thank you Vanessa. Um, it's really important that we use the chemicals, if we are going to use chemicals for sanitizing appropriately. We use the right amount that is recommended by the manufacturer. Um, there are other ways to sanitize and those include very hot water is another way to sanitize. But many people in food service, whenever you eat out, um, they are using some type of sanitizer because they need to, to reduce the amount of organisms that might be on the cutting boards or their tables, their counters, and so on. But in too high amounts, again, we can have these other risks um, with chemicals. So you did very well. Thank you for your participation in these chat box. Uh, pesticides, detergents, sanitizers, and other chemicals that might be on the farm, like pesticides. So to reduce chemical food safety risks associated, associated with produce, keep the chemicals locked and stored away from produce packing and storage, uh, train workers and develop detailed standard operating procedures for them to follow, and keep the um, Keep the data sheets on site, keep, keep things on hand so they know what to do in case they splash some of the chemicals in their eyes. And when you're using oils or lubricants or chemicals, again, use it according to their label use. Some are for around food, others are not. And then always be sure that you're using non-reactive materials. And that's right, someone said MSDS. Uh, thank you. That should say MSDS sheets, material safety data sheets on site. And I, I should I, I should have said this at the start. I do want to credit um, the slides that we have were adapted from the Produce Safety Alliance Grower Training, and they were all developed by Cornell. So I do want to thank them for uh, providing these, and also a three-inch binder with a lot more information. A little bit more about physical food safety risks. Uh, think about what could fall into the food that you don't want there. Um, you know, you don't want hair in there, of course, but you also don't want wood, metal, glass, plastic, or other foreign objects. And to reduce these chances for physical food safety risks, you can do things like screen or cover your overhead light bulbs, um, replace with shatterproof fixtures. Uh, inspect bearings, other moving equipment to make sure they're working the way they should. Uh, be sure to cover packing materials and produce containers to reduce the risk of any physical hazards from getting into the food. Uh, physical hazards can do lots of different things. Um, you know, if you had wood or plastic in an item that someone were to eat, that could pose choking risks. Uh, it could do, you know, lots of lots of harm. It could chip teeth. There, there's all sorts of things that can happen if you have stones and other foreign objects in the in the produce. And thank you, uh, glass uh, from Todd and bread bag twist ties. Exactly, those are excellent examples of things that could end up in food that we don't want there, as well as lubricants. You guys had coffee before you came on. This is great. All right, so some, some big challenges with produce safety include the fact that most of the time we're going to consume fresh produce raw. In other words, not cooked. 
And the other problem or challenge, I guess I should say, with keeping fruits and vegetables safe is that it's hard to remove once it's on there. So once we have contamination that's occurred, it could get into those scars on the, the fruit or vegetable. It, it tends to be in the bruised areas or the cuts. And if we have very rough surfaces, so you can see the picture in the center, that's a cantaloupe skin, with that netting on the outside, that roughness or even folds, and the large surface area, if you think about a cabbage or a head of lettuce, it becomes very challenging to rinse that off. And then the other thing that's happened is that this contamination that happens is sort of sporadic. It's not like a regular event. It's just sort of, look, oh, oh, now we have a produce outbreak with lettuce. Oh, now we have one with onions and, and so on. And then the other thing that makes it a challenge is that bacteria can multiply on the surfaces and also in the wounds if you have the right conditions present. So you have the right temperature. Give it enough time. You don't have it cooled down, chilled, for example. So we talked a little bit about some of the microbes. Now how does it all get there? So uh, we're going to mainly focus on humans and animals. But certainly we also can have other sources like soil and water, even our buildings, the tools we use, and the other equipment that we use. So there's a lot of ways that we can interject all these different contaminating factors. In fact, I think one of the produce outbreaks linked with spinach was due to a wild boar getting into the field. So, you know, Fortunately, I don't think we have any of those in our state, but uh, certainly animals can be an issue. So, you know, you can think about yourself, whether you have your own garden or whether you grow food for a market. Just know that we, you know, we humans can certainly spread contamination. Um, so that's why we really have to think about our own hygiene practices. Yes, we're going out to have fun and play in the dirt, and unfortunately on a day when I have huge snowflakes falling in my window, I'm not, I'm not thinking that I'm going to be planting a garden soon. I wish I were. But um, we have to think about our hygiene practices. We, If we are working with you know, people who are helping us in our fields, we have to provide adequate training. We have to teach proper hand washing practices. We have to provide toilet facilities for the workers. And if we are sick, let's say we have the flu or we have, you know, we have diarrhea, we've got some gastrointestinal issues, we shouldn't be working handling food, whether that's, you know, in our house, in a food service operation or out in the field. Um, the other things and injuries that produces blood, maybe you cut your hand and you get that blood on the fresh produce, that can certainly um, pose a huge food safety issue. And in that case, you'd have to get rid of that whole section that was contaminated with the blood. How about these animals? Certainly domesticated and wild animals can carry and transmit those pathogens, E. coli, salmonella, and so on. And in fact, in some cases, um, you know, it's, it's hard to control animals, the, especially wild animals, uh, from getting into, into our gardens, into our fields. And that can result, if they get in, in direct fecal contamination of both the crops and the fields. So as they move through, you know, their hide can certainly carry the contaminants. And they can also contaminate water sources that you're using to, to uh, irrigate. And further, runoff from manure can, can contaminate fields, other water sources, and even other crops. So animals can definitely be an issue, and they have been shown to be an issue. Uh, as well. 
so we have different types of water. And again, if, if water is a topic that you want more, you want to learn more about, certainly let us know on the follow-up survey and I can talk to our water specialists because that is a huge, very complex area of FISMA. In fact, there was about an inch <laughs> of a three-inch binder was about water, I think. Um, because water can carry and also spread the human pathogen and in fact can contaminate an entire field or a large amount of produce. Once it's on, once that produce has become contaminated, it's really difficult to remove the microorganisms. So we might have production water from irrigation, crop spring. Um, we might have post-harvest water from cooling the produce, washing it, waxing, cleaning. And then unexpected events. Um, we've certainly had enough flooding over the years in, in North Dakota to know how that can affect crops. So water definitely is a concern. Um, some other things to think about, um, soil amendments. Soil amendments might be raw manure or other amendments, which can become a source of contamination if not properly handled and applied. So for example, if it's applied too close to harvest, that could certainly become a food safety issue. Um, improper composting, as someone mentions in the chat box, not storing it right, not so storing the soil amendments correctly, um, spread by the wind, uh, runoff, cross-contamination due to improper sanitation procedures. So, you know, again, I'm, I'm talking mainly about good agricultural practices today, but I want to um, let you know as we learn more about FISMA, as this series of workshops goes on, that FISMA does require you to come up with a food safety plan to manage all of these hazards. And if any of you have ever had training on Hazard Analysis Critical Control Point, or HACCP, I found a lot of similarities in what FISMA teaches and what I've learned from that other system that we use more in food processing. So again, soil can certainly be a source of contamination. Well, then we also may have surfaces, equipment, tools, buildings, um, not cleaning, not having a proper cleaning schedule or sanitizing schedule. Even areas outside your building that are not kept mowed can serve as pest harborage areas. They, they want to, you know, hang out <laughs> like those rabbits that like to hang around in our area, in our yard. Uh, standing water can become a source of contamination. So part of this is just inspecting what you have going on. And I'll, I'll say this also includes just home gardening. Just thinking about all those rabbits and different things that can get around and how can we how can we prevent them from getting in and hanging out in our in our food. So I I did want to um I'll continue here shortly, but I've taken a quick break here to remind you that we have a lot of resources that I think are pretty helpful. Um, it's on our Field of Fork website. We have a website within the website that's called Food Entrepreneur. And we have learning modules. And if you open up those modules, you will see um, there's probably eight or ten different modules. One of them is on farmers market food safety. And I believe we also included uh, composting of manure and things like that. So that's a place to learn more. All right, so let's go back to these humans. <laughs> uh, workers can certainly be a food safety concern because of course, we all can carry human pathogens. We can carry Shigella and shed it, and which can get to you know, our produce if we're handling it and not washing our hands properly. Um, we can, workers can certainly spread these pathogens because most of the time when you harvest and pack things, you're using your hands. And hands are notorious for holding bacteria, spreading it from one place to another. So again, we do need to provide training and whether that's your, you know, your family that are helping you or people that you hire to help you, really important to teach proper hand washing 
and have a policy on illnesses and injuries because getting blood, getting pathogens from hands can certainly lead to foodborne illness outbreaks. So how does it get, again, from us to somewhere else? Okay, well, feces, clothing, our hands, cuts, the tools, and even what we wear on our feet. <laughs> so those boots or shoes and so on, those are all routes of contamination. So it's really important as we're as we're teaching people, as we're working, you know, to try to be sure that food is handled safely. It's really important to have these good communication supports. Um, we need to identify risks and do what we can to reduce those risks. So if you, for example, are a grower and you have people working for you, it's important to offer some training. How do you identify a food safety risk? So you're walking out in the field and you see deer poop, okay? It's a food safety risk. How can you reduce those risks that you find? And who to tell? And then always assure people that their food safety concerns are going to be taken seriously. So communication is always key in safe food handling whether it's for ourselves, our families, or for the public. So some things for workers to remember. Um, they must maintain personal cleanliness. They really shouldn't be petting the dog and so on. They should avoid contact with animals unless it's a working animal. They should maintain their gloves in a sanitary condition if they're using gloves. And gloves might be plastic gloves in some cases, or it could be reusable, washable gloves in other cases. Um, we always say in food safety that keeping hand jewelry off our hands is a good idea. Uh, wearing hair restraints, someone mentioned. Not eating, chewing gum, or using tobacco in an area used for a covered activity. A covered activity refers to something that's under the regulations of FSMA. If you're sick, and that usually means you have a fever, um, flu-like symptoms, you should tell your supervisor and always, always, always wash your hands. I, I spend a lot of my time um, teaching proper hand washing. In fact, this slide shows some of the times, and you all know this, of course, when hands should be washed, certainly after using the toilet before starting or before returning to work, before and after eating, and after smoking, if you happen to smoke, uh, before you put on your gloves. What I see a lot of times as I've worked with students and also professionals is that people put their gloves on and they don't wash their hands. Um, certainly want to wash them first. If you touch an animal or animal waste, you have to wash your hands very thoroughly and then any other time. And I didn't include specific information about what kind of soap should be used, but it really doesn't matter what kind of soap. You should use soap. I use soap. But it doesn't have to be antibacterial. In fact, some of the latest research that's come out really stresses that some of the antibacterial products are probably worse for us than just regular, regular soap, you know, like liquid soap is probably easiest to, to deal with. But some of those antibacterial products are probably worse for the environment and worse for you know us in general because they have been shown, particularly this triclosan product, that might actually promote the development of resistant strains of bacteria. So the, the word I'm getting as I you know go to different conferences is just use soap, not super special soap. And the same would hold true at home. And it doesn't even matter what temperature the water is, um, as long as that water, you know, keep your hands under the water and, you know, scrub your hands long enough. I don't think I have my number of seconds listed so far. So how many seconds should we wash our hands? 20 how seconds. How long should we wash our hands? 20 is correct. You can wash some 30, that's good. 
<laughs> twinkle, twinkle, little star. Yes, exactly. So we want to wash and scrub our hands thoroughly. That's extremely important. Probably the best food safety rule there is. Um, with clothing, when we're handling fresh produce, you know, because we aren't necessarily cooking our fresh produce, uh, lettuce isn't exactly uh, too appetizing when it's boiled, um, we have to think about avoiding contamination from other things, like clothing. Um, keep our keep our footwear clean. Um, if we happen to be wearing reusable gloves, they should be you know, cleaned often. Um, aprons, other food safety equipment, must be removed before using the bathroom and then stored in a clean designated area. So these are just some things that you know I think are all common sense, but sometimes get forgotten. Um, the times to exclude a, a worker from handling food would be if they had symptoms, and I've mentioned a couple of these, um, diarrhea certainly, fever, but also nausea or vomiting or jaundice or that yellowing which could indicate hepatitis. So an ill worker must not handle fresh produce because they could certainly transfer their illness to that produce. And it's kind of amazing how long, in some cases, some of these bacteria can survive on inanimate objects. So if they're sick, they, they need to go home and get better. If the worker uh, hurts him or herself, be sure that you have a first aid kit ready. Um, they should clean and bandage wounds. And any produce that could have gotten contaminated, maybe they bled a little bit, they cut their hand when they were trimming off, you know, lettuce or whatever they happen to be harvesting. Um, make sure that you have the proper first aid and that you discard any produce that could have gotten contaminated with any bodily fluid. And if you're the supervisor, they should report their injuries to you. Very important. Um, again, with animals, we're going to step back into the animal designation. They can carry human pathogens. They can spread them when they deposit their feces in the fields. They're very, very hard to control. Birds are flying all over the place. Squirrels are going crazy right now. They're flying all over the place, too. Not flying, but running. Um, even the best fence can be breached. So it's it's very difficult to control and FISMA does acknowledge the difficulty of controlling these animals in nature. So we, we really have to do the best we can and use fencing and use different sorts of things. So, you know, in some cases, as you can read, I won't read these to you, but depending on the species, there may be some other management options. And sometimes the species that come through are just transient. They're just kind of flying through on their way to Canada or some other state. So again, we, we need to do whatever we can to manage these, manage the wildlife. And I'm certain that you know, wildlife experts would be able to help us in terms of what, what we can and cannot do. So how do you assess the risk? Uh, think about this. Do you find wildlife feces in your produce fields? Is your farm in an area with a large number of animals that come through, like flocks of migrating birds or herds of deer? And what management practices can you use to limit those from contaminating both your fields as well as your water? So this is, this is again, is a big part of FISMA, is controlling and, well, first assessing and then managing the risks the best that you can. So some things you can do, and there's our, our feral pig over there. Um, during the growing season, monitor for feces and in evidence of intrusion, evaluate the risk, and consider past observations. Right before harvest, look for fecal contamination um, or signs of animal activity because chances are that species hasn't had a time hasn't had time to compost so it still could certainly be a, you know could be a contamination source 
So you have to decide if a portion of your crop can be safely harvested. So what can we do? Um, decoys, fencing, netting, and so on are all some options um, that you can use to help deter them. Some use sound. The old scarecrows probably still work. Uh, noise deterrence, tactile repellents, or the relocation program. I think that's a possum down in the corner. Um, those uh, live traps, I guess they're called. And also the little, uh, my daughter would love this, the, um, the little inflatable things that they have a lot of times at car dealerships. Those, those scare animals as well. So there are a lot of different ways that you can deter wildlife. What about our domesticated animals? Well, livestock and pets may also harbor human pathogens. And even our domesticated animals sometimes are used in fields. So you have to, again, do your assessment, decide on the risk, and then decide if the animals are allowed or whether they're likely to enter your production field. So you have to keep track of them. We have three dachshunds in my yard. And unfortunately, they breached our fence and uh, got into our garden, hurt themselves. <laughs> they learned their lesson. Um, Domesticated animals, again, decide if they're allowed in the field. And then make sure, if you have workers working with you, that they're aware of these cross-contamination risks. And also think about whether or not these production fields are rotated. So again, lots of things to think about with both wild and domesticated animals. Um, working animals. Uh, the best way, as it says on the slide, to minimize risk is to not allow working animals in the field when the edible portion of the crop is present. So keep them out if it's time to harvest that lettuce or spinach or whatever hap you happen to be growing. Um, establish paths. Have a standard operating procedure that outlines the practices to take. And then be sure, again, that anyone working with the animals understands the risks and is trained to minimize the risks, and finally develop some standard operating procedures for that manure handling that's inevitable if you have animals working. And what about Fido and kitty cats? Uh, they should be excluded from produce fields, because even though we love our pets, um, they can certainly carry pathogens as well. Uh, if you happen to have a, a farm with a petting zoo, really, really important that you have hand washing sinks available and signage. Um, visitors should be instructed to leave their pets at home. So there's a lot of special precautions. You know, I'm not sure that a petting zoo is necessarily a good thing close to a produce pick your own field, certainly. So you do need to, um, you know, if that's your case, Think about you know, how to handle that if you are going to be under FSMA regulations. So just um, wrapping up here in the next few minutes, minutes um, one thing I did want to mention, and I thought of this as I was showing you the opening slide. Think back to the complexity of the food safety system. Ice is a food. And if you're using ice for post-harvest cooling, it must be made from safe or potable water. And that means that it's free from detectable E. coli. Um, equipment used to make and distribute ice should be cleaned and sanitized. Um, I didn't put the slide in here, but I have a, an outbreak that was linked to ice that sickened 500 people at a fair in New York because runoff from a livestock feeding lot had gotten into the water supply, which also fed this fair water supply. They used the water to make ice. And anyone who had a cold beverage, or nearly everyone, at least 500 of them, became ill with E. coli. So ice freezing does not kill bacteria. 
and ice can certainly be a source of contamination. So be really cautious about your ice. Uh, don't stack boxes containing ice produce above other boxes. Again, that could be a source of contamination. Um, transportation. Let's so say you're taking your, your fresh produce to the market. If you're going to have a great day, be sure that your, your vehicle is also kept clean or you have things in boxes so it is excluded from anything that might be in your pickup box or van or whatever you're hauling it in. Um, some farms may use vehicles for many farming purposes and also for personal use. So again, cleaning, clean liners, other barriers are very important. Uh, inspect them. So part of FISMA also, um, you know, again, if you're interested in any of the things that I have in my binder, I'm happy to share. Um, there are inspection sheets for various aspects of safety. So inspect your vehicle. Make sure it's, you know, documented that it's kept clean. And again, that can be part of FISMA food safety plans. And if your vehicle happens to be refrigerated, make sure the refrigeration unit is functioning well and at the proper temperature. And uh, just wanted to um, wrap up here with a little bit on cleaning and sanitizing. Sometimes we use these two terms as if they're the same thing. And cleaning is different. Cleaning is removing dirt, soil, and usually water in a detergent. Sanitizing is reducing or eliminating microorganisms. So sanitizing is probably even more important than cleaning because it takes down the number of bacteria and other microorganisms. So there's two steps. First you clean and then you sanitize. So this is a, uh, a picture um, from one of our handouts that we have on our Extension Service website. And again, if anyone is interested, these are printable. You can use them as you want. But these are, this was a consumer handout that uh, we adapted a few years ago. It's six steps to safer fruits and vegetables. So the first thing you do is check them. Make sure you're, you know, look out for a lot of bruised dam or damaged produce because often the bacteria is harbored in those bruises. It doesn't matter if the vegetable or fruit is weird shaped or unusual looking. Um, it's not a beauty contest. It's, um, but if it's bruised, that those bruises could harbor the contamination. Cleaning, the next one. Um, that's, that includes everything from washing your hands to rinsing the produce and running tap water. That's all that's recommended for home use. And just as a note, those prepackaged vegetables that we buy labeled ready to eat, washed, or tripled rinsed do not have to be washed and cleaned again. Those are ready to eat out of the bag. Um, separate is to avoid cross-contamination. Again, watching out for your equipment and so on. If you're going to cook it or if you get your, um, that's certainly a kill step, but if you touch these fresh fruits and vegetables to raw milk, poultry, seafood, or their juices, you need to throw it away or cook it because then you can kill that bacteria that might be present. And chill within two hours and toss if um, the cut produce has not been kept refrigerated within two hours of cutting, peeling, or cooking. So, so anyway, this handout is from the USDA and it is on our website and it's called Six Steps to Safer Fruits and Vegetables. So again, just about done and I'm just finishing up. Produce safety begins with your commitment. So identify the safety risks on your farm or in your garden or if you're working with people as an educator. Support the implementation of food safety policies to reduce risks. Provide equipment and facilities. Uh, support effective food safety training so everyone is involved because we're all part of this big picture. So I could take something that you know, was safely produced on someone's farm and bring it into my house 
take out a cutting board, cut up a piece of chicken, and put my lettuce on top. And I've undone everything that someone has done from the field to my table. So really important to realize that everyone plays a role. And then, you know, be the person that sets a good example and a consistent example on your farm. It's 3 o'clock, and um, I'd like to thank you for attending this, this Wednesday webinar. I will take any questions for the next few minutes, but certainly if you need to leave, you certainly can. But you will be getting a survey to fill out, and again, I'd really appreciate if you'd take the time and also join us next time. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the interesting topics that are coming up. So thank you. So I have a question from Jean. It's hard to keep cats out of my garden. My own cats and the neighbors, they head under the squash to grab bunnies. I've never even thought about this being an issue. Anyone have any ideas for Jeannie about cats? <laughs> you have to find something more interesting. Okay, vinegar. Okay, um, close. <laughs> Wait, says so close to no tails. <laughs> Uh, you know, all I can think of is fencing or netting or um, something more interesting for the cats to play with. Uh, someone asked about vinegar. Vinegar rinse does not necessarily remove bacteria from produce. All that's currently recommended for removing bacteria from produce is um, just plenty of running water. There are some physical things that you could use, like baking soda can be used to sprinkle some on as sort of a mild abrasive. But um, I don't know if Cliff is still on the call or not, but I know his wife, who's a microbiologist on campus, did some studies with vinegar. And I, I think one of the downsides of using vinegar on produce was actually that it left that pickled flavor. So it wasn't necessarily effective. It doesn't hurt. Lemon juice wouldn't hurt either. Any other questions for me? I'm happy for any follow-up. If you're shy and you don't want to ask me a question online, go ahead and um, get in touch with me. And thanks again for attending today's webinar. <laughs>